But let's take a look at the compiler. Let's look at the main program first. And there's some stuff in the main program up here at the top, some declarations. It works over some command line arguments. And then you'll see that it goes into this section that I'm going to highlight right here. OK. But the first piece of that section, this one right here, says scan. So what part is that? Apparently, it doesn't have to start out with a symbol table. It starts out with reading the file in, and then it scans it. And it does some sort of stuff when it does the scanner. And then you see it does some things where it has a parser. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any type checking in this little language. Actually, there isn't. And then it goes to a thing that does code generation. So let's take a look at the scanner. You'll see that there's a nice comment at the top that says this is the things it's going to scan. And yeah, this isn't a language you've pro probably programmed in, but you can kind of get the general idea, and there's a nice compliment that says implement with DFA. We talked about regular expressions and deterministic finite automata. Guess what? It's using a deterministic finite automata. So it does some sort of processing, whatever that stuff is, and then here's a loop. And as soon as you see a loop like this where you go, oh, it's picking up some sort of input at the top of the loop, and then suddenly we get into statements with case statements. And you look at that, and you know it's a deterministic finite automata, and you go, okay, the person has taken the, the tokens, and they've turned it into, instead of using regular expressions, they've hand-coded the state machine for this. We looked at state machines. Here's an actual implementation of a state machine that's looking at input and turning it into tokens. And you could go grunging down this and figure out what the state machine is. But basically, yeah, they've got a state machine in here. And here's how one is implemented with switch statements in code that actually like goes through and picks through a piece of code and figures out what the things are. And combines them into tokens. So here's your regular expressions hand-coded into a scanner. And the next piece after the scanner is the parser. Let's take a look at the parser. This particular compiler uses a parser written in a particular thing that takes parsers in a grammar and converts them into code for the language. So it actually uses a parser generator tool. There are parser generator tools for almost every different target language out there. The most common being a thing called Bison. This is an implementation of Bison, but it's for the Go programming language. And Bison can generate code for C, C++, Java. There are others for if you want to build a parser in Python or some other language. Quite often, there are generator tools that take the grammar and convert it into this parser. So this particular one, we've got some things that say the top is either a statement or a top followed by a statement. And statements are an ID equals expression semicolon. OK, so there's a grammar in here. And it does some sort of code in between that says that, by golly, it's adding a symbol for this ID when it does this. but you look at this and you go, OK, I see that it validates symbols, it uses symbols, it has increments and decrements. But you could extract the language from this and actually see what the different pieces of the expression are. And somewhere down in here, it even has parenthesized expressions. Um, there's a class on compiler constructions. You'd actually use this kind of a tool and you'd actually build a compiler. This is a pretty simple language that it does, but here's the grammar for the language. And here's the system that it uses. And you'll notice that in lots of these things, like this one for a subtraction, it says that when I do a subtraction, what I'm doing is a new AST, a new abstract syntax tree. So the results of this parser is it generates a tree of the code. So you can look at the code generator. And the code generator takes input as an abstract syntax tree, actually an array of abstract syntax trees. And 
it makes multiple passes over these trees to generate code and generate variables. And at the end of it, if we go and look at some of these things, we'll see that these passes eventually emit values and strings in assembly code. So these are the pieces in a compiler, and this is how it works. And obviously, this particular compiler, it actually generates the assembly code, which is going to then be run through the assembler to produce the final code. So this compiler isn't any different than a fancier compiler. It just has a much simpler language. If we look at the tiny little language that it'll compile, it's just an expression language that always has variables automatically created, like b equals 8 and a equals 3 plus b times 2 and put A. But it can translate that into our destination assembly language and make it much easier to build programs. I want to go on to talking about interpreters. The alternative to building a compiler is an interpreter. An interpreter runs a program without necessarily converting it directly to assembly language code. And there are lots and lots of interpreters that we use all the time. The most commonly used piece of software in the world that has about seven, they calculate 74% of all the structured data in the world stored in it is Excel. And it's an interpreter where we can put in values and we can put in calculations on those values. And we can get the results. And when I put in that formula, the way that it works is it's actually going out and interpreting that formula and running it right there. In fact, Excel has a unique property in that it is actually a functional programming language interpreter. So if I go back and I change the data, I immediately get the new functional output. So it's a really common interpreter that probably lots of you have used. And if you've never used Excel as a spreadsheet, you should go out and give it a try, at least for calculating things. It's a marvelous tool for calculating all sorts of stuff. We could look at another kind of interpreter. For instance, our microcode language. If I go over here and I, it'll take me a second to bring up the console, but we can bring up the console and we can actually like look at the different things. And at the console, I can actually unsuccessfully run a function call, but the console inside the browser is actually a JavaScript interpreter. So if I do um, some expression, I can actually run stuff. And I actually have access to all the source code, and I can sit there and run things and test things interactively on the system that I'm working on. So the piece of code that's actually running is using multiple different interpreters to render the browser's page. There's an interpreter that takes the HTML and the structured vector graphics and renders the what appears on the page. There's an interpreter that takes that and applies cascading style, style sheets to it. And there's a JavaScript interpreter that allows you to write this unusual little language JavaScript, which today is the most common language in the world, and run those pieces of JavaScript interactively in there. For instance, I can do and set up test 1000 in here and actually run a particular test. So over here in the front end, when I say set up test and click on that, What's happening is an event is bringing up this form, and when I pick a particular test, like that particular test, and I run the test, underneath the covers, it's calling a JavaScript function that does something, and running the interpreter at that moment in time to set up that test. And everything you click on on a user interface that doesn't end up sending a page to some server, that's how it works, is there's actually a piece of JavaScript code being interpreted on the fly. One of those interpreters that started out was a thing called Java, and it was built 
more like a compiler than a standard interpreter. The way it worked is it took its input, its Java code, and translated it into a non-existent machine that was going to be going to be emulated. And we know something about emulators now. And this Java system took that particular thing and built it into this intermediary code. The intermediary code was then run in an emulator so that you could build and compile these things. The advantage of building a compiler for a fake machine is that instead of having to rebuild all the front-end tools in the compiler, you only had to implement the emulator for each new piece of hardware that you wanted it to run on. So it had tremendous portability advantages. The disadvantage with Java and most uh, interpreters is that they're slow, probably 10 to 40 times slower than compiled code. So what did they do about this? Since lots of people were using it, they wanted to make it faster. And the first thing they did is they made the emulators faster. And then they went along and said, well, we could also compile the code on the fly. And they turned their original code into some sort of, of machine code with a thing called a just-in-time compiler. And the way the just-in-time compiler would work is when you would run something, it would look at the Java bytecodes that it was running, and it would actually turn those into little pieces of assembled and compiled code that it would then run instead of running it through the emulator. And it would build up the pieces of code as it went as you were running. So the virtual machine actually included a compiler that would translate to a particular hardware. It still had a lot of the advantages of being easier to port, but it also had a bunch of disadvantages. One of those disadvantages, for example, is we talk about a von Neumann architecture machine where you have just one memory where all the code sits in the same memory as the data. And we've also talked about Harvard architecture where the code and the data sit in two different pieces of memory and you can never execute code in data, which has some tremendous security advantages. But in a Harvard architecture machine, you can't build a just-in-time compiler because the compiler needs to generate code, new data, and then run that code on the fly. So you can't build one of these Java machines that's efficient and have it work on a Harvard architecture. There's some indications that Apple and iOS are headed towards using a Harvard architecture because it does provide better security, which would be a, a death kennel blow to the world of Java programs. So yeah, there are advantages and disadvantages to that. Interpreters tend to be easier to implement. And also, you're familiar with building interpreters now because you've actually implemented one. When you built the emulator for the uh, Maria instruction set, you built an interpreter that ran the instructions. So you actually have personal experience building and using one of these things to see how they work inside. And it's a good representation of not just the architecture of machines, but actually how an awful lot of interpreters work. Is they go out, they read some stuff, they fetch in some instructions, they run those instructions, and they produce some input and output. So it's a really good example to be working from in your future for, I want to interpret this, I want to build a custom language that's domain specific. This is the way interpreters are built on the inside.